Kirk Shelmerdeen right now is running in 40th place. He's uh, kind of tail end Charlie on this field, but he's a native of Philadelphia, and he's got a lot of fans here. <laughs> yes, he does. You yeah. know, you get a little glimpse of them later on here. I think the reason that it's slower, I mean, running quicker, is because the track temperature is cooler. All right, here comes Kirk Shelmerdeen. Lions trucking right at the front straightaway. There they all are, and waving for Kirk right next to the start finish line. Got a lot of fans here, and every time he goes by, Young kid there just held a big 72 sign. So every driver has a fan base out there. It's good to see. If you've seen a certain other video on this channel, the story of Donald L. Arnold will sound familiar at first. He was the son of Arthur L. Arnold, who in 1959 was forced to retire from his position as an executive at Woolworths. Destitute, Arthur moved his family to Naples, Florida, where they made a new living in real estate. After young Donald graduated from the University of Florida on a basketball scholarship, he helped at the business that would soon become the Arnold Group. Over the following decades, the Arnolds would develop commercial and industrial parks that branched out into shopping malls and golf courses. By the time Donald took over, the group consisted of 18 separate companies worth millions of dollars. He would then go on to buy the NASCAR team that is the subject of this video. But Don Arnold was no Bobby Ginn. By all accounts, the man known as Big Papa was a respected businessman who avoided the pitfalls of his contemporary. This was reflected as much in his NASCAR career, where he took on the challenge of rebuilding one of NASCAR's once great teams and gave some struggling veterans a second chance. It turned out to be the first chapter of a story that didn't end until just a few short weeks ago. As if by divine retribution, they returned from the brink of extinction in even greater numbers. They arose anger in some, admiration in others, but each knew 2004 was their chance to rise. They were the Field Fillers! While he would later say his NASCAR team was just a toy, Don Arnold had dreamed of becoming involved in racing for many years. According to Dean Arnold, one of his sons, he'd been going to races at Daytona and Sebring since the 1960s, but it was a chance encounter with a racing legend that made him think of team ownership. There were some articles I was reading that said something about uh, your father meeting Dale Earnhardt in the Bahamas. Were, were you familiar with that? I was actually there at the time. Yep. What's the story? Uh, the story with Dale was, yeah, he came down on Sunday morning, stayed in Treasure Key, and uh, he was, uh, you know, like two slips down from us uh, on the T dock at Treasure. And we actually ended up spending uh, most of our uh, early evenings uh, on Dale's boat, uh, having beverages and, and telling stories. And Michael Walter came down, and a uh, few of the other guys came down, uh, Penske, they all came down to the Bahamas, and we all had to fish together, and boat together, and drink together, and have a good time. Earnhardt also made some adjustments to Dean's speedboat. He actually worked on my race boat a little bit when I uh, brought my dad and everybody down there in the race boat, and uh, Dale jumped in there and threw all my carburetors away. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he ordered me new ones and had a brand new carburetor shipped in. That means that he, he, I, I quadra jets and he didn't like any quadra jets. He likes the Holly carburetor. So, uh, yeah, the, the Dale Earnhardt thing down there in Treasure was a big uh, factor of my dad getting uh, more involved in the whole series. After Earnhardt died at Daytona in 2001, Don Arnold, now 58, became more determined than ever to start a team of his own. The next year, an opportunity presented itself from the team that started second in Earnhardt's last race. Melling Racing had entered a car in every Daytona 500 from 1982 through 2002, and at the time, only three teams had a longer streak. Harry Melling had bought the team from Bill Elliott, who drove the iconic number nine to the first 34 of his 44 cup wins and the championship in 1988. After Harry died in 1999, his son Mark tried to keep the team going, but they remained winless since Elliott's departure after the 91 season. By 2002, with dwindling sponsorship and just eight employees, the team made their final start in August at Michigan. On December 17th, two days before Melling suspended operations, Don Arnold announced he had bought the team for $2.5 million. Co-owned by Keith Coleman, Arnold Motorsports planned to field a full-time cup entry in 2003 and add a second car by July. 
The team would run Fords, using Hopkins chassis for most races and Laughlin chassis for the super speedways. They had a deal to run engines from Robert Yates Racing and soon hired a rookie driver. Originally a, a buddy of ours here in Naples, a good friend of ours and also a business partner. His son was a race car driver and got involved in the truck series and then uh, we, we took him from truck to, to cup. That driver was fellow Naples resident Billy Bigley Jr. At the time, the 40-year-old Bigley had claimed the 2000 championship at the Slim Jim All-Pro Series, won an ARCA race at Memphis, and completed a full season in the Truck Series with a best finish of fifth. The Arnold team consisted of just 14 crew members, including Don's son Stuart Arnold, whose closest experience to racing was as a caddy in the PGA. On June 27, 2003, the team hired NASCAR legend Bobby Allison to serve as their vice president and consultant. While Allison's presence didn't improve the team's sponsorship issues, they did move closer to finally hitting the track. The team ditched their plans with Yates and Ford and went with Arrington engines and Dodges. Apparently unable to use the Dodges that Melling already had, the team instead bought Dodges that Ward Burton had raced at Bill Davis Racing and tested them at the USA Speedway in Lakeland, Florida. The team also set to work building two more cars of their own, briefly bringing the team's inventory to five cars. Briefly, that is, until Big Lee crashed three laps into his test at Kentucky. It was perhaps this reason that NASCAR didn't approve Big Lee to run at Indianapolis, where the team planned to make their debut, so P.J. Jones drove in the next test. NASCAR then changed their mind, clearing Big Lee to make his first Cup Series attempt. No other backer joined Arnold Motorsports for Indy, where only a logo for Arnold Development Companies adorned car number 79. Big Lee ran 29th in Friday's practice, then set out for qualifying. So Jim Sauter will live for another day. Another car, anyway. Billy Bigley Jr. has uh, been around in NASCAR short track racing and southeastern short track racing for a long time. He's a 41-year-old out of Naples, Florida. Long-time standout on the NASCAR Southwest Series, formerly the All-Pro Series. And he's here to take a shot at his dream. A uh, real estate developer in his hometown by the name of Don Arnold talking to Billy about wanting to go racing and wanting to go racing with Billy and Billy said when you're ready call me and they had a conversation last fall and Billy said well what are we going to do the truck series maybe the bush series and Mr. Arnold said no we're going Winston Cup racing and they cut a deal with the Melling Racing team oh! <laughs> for their equipment and uh, support and here they are at Indy trying to make the Brickyard 400. We talked about Billy Bigley in the All-Pro Series he drove for a guy Don Jacobson, Heroes Woodworking, that sits right beside the Bristol Motor Speedway and always has been a huge fan of Billy Bigley's. I'll tell you what, he's doing good. Yeah, he's he's good in this that. show. He, oh, that man, wall. right up against that wall. He's in this show. If he can make it one more quarter, it's slowing down. Yeah, he lost stop, ball, stop. Quit. Quit going that way. Oh, man. He scrubbed off a bunch of time there. Up, I don't think. 50 oh, five. Hang on. He's going to run. He has to run another lap while he has no choice. But does he have enough oxygen? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Can he breathe, you mean? Yeah. Billy's 41 year old. He is living in an apartment in the Charlotte area. His family is still down in Naples. He's got a daughter that's a year away from graduating high school and didn't want to do that whole um, moving thing in the middle of all this to take a shot at this. So. Still a good lap right here if he can just hang on. Yeah, if he can stay at four tenths, a half second, this will make it. Ball, you gotta stop. He's gonna make it. You gotta stop, ball. No. Time is turn four. Yeah. This north end of the speedway has not been kind to Billy. I think it's a little faster, isn't it? To the yard of bricks, a little faster into the 49s. It's still in 33rd spot. Ooh, that thing's hot. 49-9-3-9. Is that fast enough? So will Billy get to live the dream and be in the Brickyard 400 on Sunday? We'll find out. Bigley improved on his second lap, but was still the second fastest car to miss the show. The only driver who came even closer was Brett Bodine, who that day was making his final attempt as a car owner. 
We are disappointed because we came here to make the race, said Big Lee. At the same time, we're not leaving here with our heads down. This Arnold Motorsports crew worked hard back at the shop to prepare for this, and we improved all weekend long. It was our first show of many, and we realized that we have the equipment, desire, and determination to run with these teams. We chose this brickyard to challenge ourselves, and I believe we opened some eyes and learned a lot this weekend about this series and ourselves. We'll go back to the shop and prepare for Bristol in a few weeks. We plan to test on August 12th and 13th. Undaunted, the team looked ahead to the rest of their planned partial schedule. After the aforementioned Bristol race would come Richmond, Dover, Martinsville, and Homestead, plus a one-off Arca start at Talladega. But again, the team struggled for speed. After Big Lee failed to qualify at Bristol, Richmond, and Dover, the team scrubbed both Martinsville and the Arca race, and instead entered Atlanta. There, Mike Hillman came over for Brepodine's closed team to take over as crew chief, but again, they failed to qualify. Totally unacceptable, said Arnold, after Big Lee ran the slowest qualifying lap at Richmond. During that same autumn of 2003, Derek Cope was trying to make ends meet with his own cup team, Quest Motor Racing. Coming into the season, he'd picked up sponsorship from Friendly's Ice Cream to back his number 37 Chevrolet. While there was only enough backing to run a few races, Cope decided to run a majority of the schedule, 28 out of 36. While he did qualify for 18 of those events, he only finished under power in six of them and racked up five last place finishes. When Derek's brother Ernie left to start working at Robert Yates Racing, Cope decided to close his team at season's end. The number 37 didn't make it to Homestead. Instead, Cope drove Arnold's Dodge. Derek's experience and ability to handle a race car will be extremely helpful in getting the Arnold Motorsports team in the race, said Arnold. With the changes at Homestead, we feel we have an excellent shot to get in the show. Mike Hillman and Derek are going to have to communicate effectively. The extra practice sessions are going to be valuable. Unfortunately, they still failed to make the Homestead race, the first with the track's current gradient banking. But again, the team stayed positive and prepared for 2004. Just days after the DNQ, Arnold bought a new shop in Mooresville and planned to change the car number from 79 to 50. While Cope's run at Homestead was first reported as a one-off, he was soon signed by Arnold to continue to drive for him in 2004. This was in addition to Cope's current Bush Series ride with Jay Robinson, where his number 49 would be sponsored by Advil. One benefit of the union was Cope's owner's points rank from 2003, which was transferred to Arnold's team, lifting them from 58th to 43rd in the standings. That rank was certain to improve even more as the number 50 ranked behind six full-time teams that would either close or scale back in the new season. Another was this nifty website where you could make your own paint scheme to the still unsponsored number 50. The designs were very much relevant to the team's current predicament. Paramount Hospitality Management, which signed with Cope late in 2003, did not follow their driver to the new team in 2004. By January, the Arnold team had two super speedway cars ready to tackle the 500 and they prepared to test both in Daytona and at Las Vegas. Team CLR Racing, a former cup team that had now shifted to ARCA, helped with the team's fabrication needs and also shared five of their pit crew members. Derek Cope on track now. 1990 Daytona 500 winner looking for his fourth start in the 500. Was unable to get into the field in last year's race. This 50 car is owned by a fellow named Don Arnold from down in Naples, Florida. Nice man. Hope he has some success this year in Nextel Cup Racing. Derek, um, if the time lap doesn't go well, or if the 125 doesn't go well for him on Thursday, we'll be using the owner points from the team that he owned, co-owned last year. Um, 37. Right? The 37 car, yeah. He's eligible to use those points here to get into the 500, so it's good news for him. And uh, 37th is the final number on Derek, just outside. Ultimately, it wasn't until February 11th, just four days before the Daytona 500, that thrifty rent -a car bought space on Cope's car. Melling Engine Parts did the same, the last vestige of the team Arnold now owned. While just 45 drivers were entered for the 43-car field, Derek Cope wasn't necessarily guaranteed a starting spot in the Great American Race. He ranked just 41st on the speed charts, forcing him to run aggressively in the first twin 125-mile qualifying race. Right side of the screen. I think there just went some blocking going on there. That's what that was all about. Bush. It's going to be for seventh place. 
That helped Kurt Busch a bunch. Got him out of the middle. Oh, okay. Hang on. Cope charged into the top 10 in the closing stages, but with just four laps to go, contact from John Andretti left him with a bad fender rub. The incident dropped him to 16th, meaning Cope had to wait until the end of race two in order to find out if he'd even start. Well, Dave, inevitably the twin 125s have some drama in them. Unfortunately, it's uh, bad drama for Derek Cope today. You were running in the top 10, looked like you were in the field easily. Then what happened, Derek? Oh, I just tried to, uh, I had a run at Andretti, and then he tried to, uh, you know, move his way in line. And then he just tried to hit me in the rear and turn me sideways. I saved it, but I lost all my momentum. And then out front, we're tough without nobody pushing. And I thought Mears was going to hang with me, and, uh, you know, he got me on the outside. I had a mistake on my part, but, uh, you know, just uh, just a fun race, uh, you know, and just unfortunate that we come up a little short. Uh, we'll just have to see how the second race goes and see if we get in or not. How difficult will it be to watch that second race, Derek? I've been there before. I'll be there again, probably, so I'll just get up there and whatever what comes may, you know, we'll deal with it. But uh, it's unfortunate for these guys because, uh, you know, they gave me a great race car, Mike Hillman, the guys that I got oiled down the first segment. Caution come out, we come in, he freed it up, and she was good from there, and I just hung out there for a while and, you know, made some good moves moves and uh, got a little bit of help and I thought we were going to be in good shape and then that uh, I let Andretti in about three times to save his ass and then uh, over here uh, he just uh, the little giant went crazy. 1990 winner will have to wait to see how race two unfolds to see if he'll be in the 500. But when Kirk Shelmerdine failed to race his way in during race two, Cope secured the 42nd starting spot. The team changed engines, ran the slowest lap in happy hour, then prepared for the 500. 14 years earlier, Cope pulled off his historic upset in the Great American Race, prevailing when race leader Dale Earnhardt blew a right rear tire in the final corner. In a cruel twist on lap 33 in 2004, Cope's left rear blew in the same corner, spinning him into the path of a passing Scott Riggs. The team managed to piece their car back together, returning to the track before the halfway point, and climbed to 30th at the checkered flag, worth $207,962. To date, this remains Cope's last start as a driver in the Daytona 500. Qualifying at Rockingham was just as treacherous. Derek Cope, the 1990 Daytona 500 winner. Matrix number 50. Ooh. Once again, Cope finished 30th on race day. At the time, he was sponsored by Matrix Systems Automotive Finishes, the only company that was sponsoring Cope before Thrifty came on board. In place of the tiny logo from the 500 car, Matrix secured the entire hood. But for the following round in Las Vegas, an entirely different sponsor would have that space, RedneckJunk.com. Founded by Tom Connolly, who identified as the lone NASCAR fan in Bolton, Massachusetts, the site was basically a classified page for people selling racing equipment and outdoor gear. The site's logo was a caricature of Connolly standing inside an engine compartment, a drawing he commissioned from an artist in Taiwan. He went through at least one draft. The first version didn't have any teeth. At redneckjunk.com, we're all about racing, said Connolly. And what better way to connect with race fans than with a sponsorship in the biggest motorsport series in America? We're planning some really fun things on the site with the redneck theme, and we want to keep it all in good humor. Despite just a 33rd place finish for Cope in the race, the site saw a big boost in traffic, 100,000 hits in the first hour. With that, Redneck Junk bought a banner ad on J-Ski, looked to sponsor other cars in the Bush North Series and Dodge Weekly Series, and would back Cope again the following week in Atlanta. But just one day before the Atlanta race, after not voicing a single complaint over the past six days, NASCAR demanded the team remove the company's logos from their car. NASCAR's spokesperson Herb Branham said, quote, We just didn't feel like that projected the proper image of our sport. It's pretty simple, added Brian France, who objected to the drawing of Connolly in particular. It was detrimental to good taste, and that was the decision. It was the name. Connolly tried to seek a compromise, even changing his domain name to rjunk.com. When we chose the name Redneck Junk, we understood there was some potential controversy associated with it, but we liked the name. It was very catchy. We didn't think NASCAR would disallow it. NASCAR still refused. Even though his sponsor had been taken away the last minute, Arnold decided not to protest NASCAR's decision. We didn't think it would be controversial, but we deferred to them. We would like to have a sponsor, but we understand the decision and I don't have a problem with it. He later added, quote, I know you have to be politically correct. The meaning of the word redneck has really changed. You used to be able to say it as a joke just in fun, but if one person thinks you're being serious, you can't say it anymore. To top it all off, Cope lost an engine in Atlanta after the halfway point, leaving him 38th. 
The hunt for sponsorship proved fruitless, but backing or none, Arnold decided to still enter his car the next week at Darlington. It was a good thing he did. Derek Cope on the racetrack. Casey Kane gets ready to head out. What do you think, Larry? I don't know. I got some more looking to do. We got to do some more checking though. out. I'm with you. Tell you what, I believe Derek Cope's on a pretty good run right here. Let's see where he's going to be. He's on the pole, guys. 2877. <laughs> but he practiced good. He practiced good. What about that? Break it in, Derek. Break it in now. Yes, That'll sir. Fly. Holy cow. Way to go, buddy. And you know who I'm happy for is old Mike Hillman. Crew is, chief. Is, is, that, is yeah. Mike the crew chief? Well, that answers it right there. And you there. know, I talked to him this morning, talked to the whole group, and, and even though no one got the test here, they just felt confident coming here for some reason, and obviously after 19 cars, they have a good reason to. The 19th car to take time, Derek Cope took the provisional pole. He remained the fastest after both Kyle Petty and Ward Burton fell short, and Casey Kane had to run the fastest pole lap there since 2000 in order to bump him to second. When the session was over, the only other drivers to place ahead of Cope in the lineup were Dale Earnhardt Jr., Greg Biffle, and Kurt Busch. Cope would line up fifth, his best qualifying effort since he was third at Dover in September 1998. It was also his best start at Darlington since he also started fifth in the 1993 Southern 500. Back at Darlington, Michael Walter congratulating Derek Cope on his great run. Let's check in with Dick Bourbon, who'll talk to him. Hey Derek, have you caught your breath yet on that? Well, yeah, you know, actually uh, the car was pretty good. It really wasn't a, it wasn't a hold your breath lap. The car was good and solid, you know, and, uh, you know, I took a chance down there and uh, matted it and the thing stuck and just a tribute to Mike Hillman and Don Arnold, everybody giving me the opportunity to run this car and uh, tell you what, Mike Eggy engines, uh, it's nice to drive really good equipment. You're having fun now, aren't you? I'm having a lot of fun. Good for you. Congratulations. Nice to see you running well. In the race, the team still didn't have a sponsor, but Fox did install onboard cameras and mentioned him early in the race. The Cinderella story of this race is Derek Cope, the 1990 Daytona 500 winner. He was good at practice and backed it up with a qualifying effort, put him up in the first three rows. Our, the Arnold Development car a couple races ago had RedneckJunk.com, a classified ad site for hunting, fishing, and, and car and pickup truck gear. NASCAR requested they take that sponsor off the hood, and the resulting publicity did great things for the website, which now just calls itself rjunk.com. That car's not junk, though. Derek is giving it a good ride. Yeah, I mean, he's back in that qualifying run-up. He has a lot of pressure right now from Rusty Wallace in the two and Jeff Gordon in the 24, but he's still sitting there solidly in the top 10. I think that's what everybody was wondering. Can they back that qualifying run-up here today on race day? Cope finished 25th the team's best run of the season. Four days after Darlington, Arnold Motorsports decided to officially part ways with Tom Connolly as sponsor. Connolly's gamble, however, had paid off, and he would soon partner with BSR Products to form an altogether new website selling race car parts, rjgoods.com. As for Arnold, he had a new backer, at least on the TV panel of his car. It was a conglomerate of car dealerships, which decades earlier had expanded from the Midwest into Arnold's hometown of Naples, Florida. Germain Motor Company. This would mark the first time Bob Germain had his name on a NASCAR stock car. Unfortunately for him, that race was Bristol. Derek Cope has spun coming to the flag, and that was, what was that, the white flag for yeah. Cope. He posted one lap, which is sixth quickest, and then he got in trouble at the opposite end of the racetrack. Uh -huh. 1549 backwards across the start finish line. I'm just not sure. Uh, everybody's car is incredibly loose. They're all just hanging on for dear life. You know, I can see DW's hotspot for Sunday being Sullivan County. <laughs> <laughs> good, good call. <laughs> I'm not far off, can am I? Can you say aerial view? Yeah. <laughs> all right, Derek Cope had posted a lap of 1549. And then here's what happens. And you just can't save it. I mean, he's out wide. He gets off there. He gets the back end into the fence, tries to catch up with it. But as soon as he turns it to the right, she goes back to the left. For the first time in 2004, Arnold Motorsports scrambled to prepare a backup. Their second car didn't even have any brake ducts on the front valence, which was unique at the time. Regardless, Cope managed to churn out a 26th place finish, nearly besting his breakout run at Darlington. On April 4th came the race at Texas, which at the time was one of the richest and most prestigious on the calendar. A strong run in this event would go a long way to solving any team's problems. Cope qualified just 31st for the race, but a two-tire stop on lap 18 jumped him all the way to 14th, 
While expected to drop back, he only slipped to 16th on the restart, then by lap 47 reached 13th. Well, I tell you who is fast, not only on the restart, but this whole run, Derek Cope in this 50 car, he started back in 31st. I've been watching his times. He's been about as quick as our leaders. He just drove by Kurt Busch in the 97 and Tony Stewart in the 20. He's up to 13th position. Big tip of the hat to Mike Hillman. His crew chief made the call to take two tires, got that track position, and he has a fast race car right now. That's another unsponsored car. He again caught the camera's eye on lap 59 when he was 12th and catching more of the leaders. Look who else is catching this pack. Derek Cope at 12th place. He's caught him. He, he is on the move. I've been watching this, this monitor and he definitely has one of the fastest cars. Cope climbed all the way to 10th, but a green flag stop on lap 84 turned catastrophic. His car stalled and the crew was nearly run over by Kurt Busch as they push started the car. Cope still held on to 14th, only to be handed a pass-through penalty because the catch can man was standing outside the pit box. With all this taking place under green, Cope plummeted to 36th. Then the drive shaft failed, leaving him 37th. Cope tried to shake off the disappointment at Martinsville, where he fought an ill-handling car in qualifying and had to take the green in 40th. He finished just 33rd. At Talladega, he debuted a completely new paint scheme, only to be devoured in the big one and finish 38th. It wasn't until the following race at Fontana that the team attracted a new primary sponsor. Still, the Bennett Lane Winery's car ran the second slowest speed in Saturday's first practice session and took the checkered flag in 31st. Six days later, Cope was at Gateway, practicing Jay Robinson's Advil Ford for the upcoming Bush Series race. Heading into turn three, his brakes locked, causing him to slam the outside wall with the driver's side. For the second time in two years, Cope was knocked unconscious in one of Robinson's cars, but was awake and alert as he was transported to the hospital. Unlike his serious crash at Richmond in 2002, he recovered in time to race at the Virginia track on May 15th. There, another sponsor joined the Arnold team in Chesapeake Mobile Homes. Cope finished 29th. At the same time, Arnold Motorsports planned to enter some ARCA races once again, this time with Justin Hobgood behind the wheel, starting at Charlotte. Bob Germain elected to expand his growing sponsorship of the Arnold team by backing the effort. At Charlotte, the team's first attempt, Hobgood finished second, with sight of winner Ryan Hemphill. Meanwhile, on the cup side, Cope's yellow Dodge was painted red for sponsor Geico Insurance, which had backed Cope during his number 37 team's early days in 2002. Cope finished 10th in the Winston Open, then 34th in the Coca-Cola 600. While the team's sponsorship issues appeared resolved, on June 2nd, Cope was released by the team and replaced by Mike Wallace. Incidentally, Wallace ran Geico sponsorship in the Bush series at the time. We decided not to use Derek at this point, said Arnold. We may go back to him, but right now we're going to try some options on drivers. Derek has done an awful lot to help us progress and bring our group forward. He brought the program a long way. Cope was understandably upset, having not been told directly by Arnold that he'd even been let go. But he said after the fact, quote, Arnold owns the race team, and he has to do what he thinks is best for his team. That's just the way this sport goes sometimes. There are no hard feelings. Some things happen for a reason. I'll talk to Don today and go pick up a couple of my race cars I have in his shop. When asked if Cope would enter one of those cars in the following race at Dover, he said, quote, I wouldn't want to do that. I want to be proficient, and that's putting a lot on your plate. For Mike Wallace, this was the seventh different cup team he'd raced for since the start of 2001. Among those teams was Foyt Racing, where in 2002 he worked with Arnold's crew chief, Mike Hillman. Making his first cup start since the 2003 race at Phoenix, Wallace ran just 35th, out after 239 laps due to a wheel bearing. The next race at Pocono saw Arnold bring back P.J. Jones, the same driver who was about to replace Billy Bigley Jr. for the team's debut at Indianapolis a year earlier. While Jones remained one of the series' road course ringers at the time, he hadn't run a cup race on an oval in four years, so he tested at Kentucky. The preparation paid off. Jones led during green flag pit stops on lap 36. This was not only the first time Arnold's car led a lap, but the first time Jones had in a part-time cup career dating back to 1993. He then battled back from two incidents in the final 25 laps, hitting the turn one wall on lap 175, then pushing in a fender battling Jamie McMurray 14 laps later to take the checkers in 22nd. It was a new season best for the team. Jones would run again the next week in Michigan, where just weeks after NASCAR cost the team a sponsor, they would promote one of the sport's initiatives. NASCAR Day was a fundraiser for the newly opened Victory Junction Gang Camp, where fans donating $5 would receive a special checkered flag ribbon lapel pin. 
The day itself was set for August 20th, where participating businesses would let their employees wear NASCAR gear at work. After starting 35th, Jones was even more impressive. On the final lap, he was running 15th when disaster struck. Boy, did he ever get a run off turn two. It's not over with yet, guys. Look at it. He just continues to pull up on the 12 car. Newman Strong at the end of the straightaway, but here comes here he Kane. Comes. Here he, he comes. Catch him. Caution is out. Caution is out. It's got to be. It's, they're coming to the checker, though. But the field is frozen. Oh, man. Even though the wreck happened in turn two, NASCAR decided to throw the caution, denying Casey Kane a shot at taking the win from Ryan Newman. When asked, NASCAR spokesman Mike Zizzo said the yellow was thrown because at least six cars were racing behind Jones and didn't want to delay safety crews from attending to him. Jones, who still took home 25th, was uninjured and would run the following week in Sonoma. There, he was a non-factor and finished 39th after rear-end trouble. Leaders at three. Here comes Dale Earnhardt Jr. He goes to the high side. Leopard's trying to block him. Look at Mike Wallace in the four on the bottom. Leopard went up and Wallace is going to win it, or is he? Lesser it's not over with yet. Lesser put Jr. in the wall. Checkered flags in the air. No caution. Mike Wallace. The following week in Daytona saw Mike Wallace score what would become the final victory of his Bush Series career. He was also set to run Saturday's cup race for Arnold Motorsports, where Geico was originally the listed sponsor. That changed as Sport Clips picked this moment to sponsor a NASCAR team for the very first time, a full six years before they signed with Joe Gibbs Racing. Wallace led on lap 73, but was involved in a mid-race wreck with Brendan Gaughan, leaving him 41st. The Daytona run marked a turning point for the Arnold team. Through the season's first half, they had completed almost 86% of the laps. In the second half, that rate plummeted to just over 33%. The trend began at Chicagoland on July 11th. With no sponsorship once again, P.J. Jones was already a lap down on the 19th circuit and went behind the wall sometime later. He returned to the track on lap 140 but was black flagged by NASCAR for running too slow, leaving him 39th. At Loudoun, the same race where Ted Christopher returned to Cup with Kirk Schumerdine racing, Mike Wallace carried Christopher's previous sponsor, Lake Air Kitchens. Wallace scraped the wall in happy hour and finished 32nd. With Wallace running the Bush race at Pikes Peak, P.J. Jones returned to Pocono but didn't have near the success he had in June. In a car that hit the rev limiter down the straightaways, Jones completed just eight laps before brake issues. This marked the first last place finish for Arnold Motorsports. The next race was Indianapolis, where Jones was nearly entered one year earlier. But the Tuesday before the race, those plans changed. And guess who's driving this car, folks? No. No. Alan Teller. This is Todd Bodine. Exactly. This week. Since the closing of Bell Car Racing, Todd Bodine had bounced between several Cup Series teams. And like Mike Wallace, he landed at Arnold Motorsports because he knew Mike Hillman. But this wasn't even the biggest news surrounding the team. Despite a recent decline in performance, Arnold would also enter Bodine in the final nine Truck Series races of 2004, with an option to go full-time in 2005. Even more than this, Bodine would run a Toyota, and the entry would be co-owned by Bob Germain, who was still sponsoring the number 50. This Germain Arnold racing team would run the number 30, and Hillman would also serve as crew chief. In the month between Indianapolis through Bodine's debut of the truck team on September 8th, Arnold's Cup team continued to struggle. Bodine finished 41st at both the Brickyard and Watkins Glen, completing just 16 and 7 laps respectively. He turned only 11 laps the next week in Michigan and finished last. Under the lights at Bristol, where Derek Cope recovered from his qualifying wreck in the spring, Bodine completed all but five laps and finished 23rd, nearly eclipsing P.J. Jones' season best at Pocono. Bodine didn't enter the following race at Fontana. He handed the wheel to Jeff Fuller, who hadn't started a Cup Series race since he was let go at Eel River Racing in early 2000. Fuller got the car into the show, but only ran five laps before overheating issues, leaving the team last once again. Todd Bodine would return at Richmond to run double duty and made a statement in the first race for Jermaine Arnold Racing. Todd Bodine qualified third. Great effort in a brand new truck. You good enough to win this thing tonight? I think we got a good truck. This Toyota Tundra was awful good in race trim. Uh, really consistent every lap. Uh, we went to qualifying trim, got a little free. It was a little free qualifying, but still got a good spot. So I'm looking forward to it. I think we got a shot at it. Okay, good luck, Todd. Bodine starts third tonight. Rick? Bodine finished fourth and looked to carry the momentum into Saturday's cup race. Once again, however, his night ended early. Todd Bodine, caution flag is out and a one-car accident. Go ahead and finish what I was talking about. 
A lot of times you'll see guys diving down into the corner underneath somebody and they lose that traction and slide up into another car. We saw that a lot, and that's going to happen tonight, I'm sure. So we can see what happened to Todd Bodan. He goes in the corner and just simply gets too high, loses traction, and when he does, that wall is right there. Crunch. Oh, look at the bits and pieces flying off. So Bodine's on pit road, and we're under caution for the first time in the Chevy Rock and Roll 400 after eight of 400 laps in Richmond. The crash left Bodine in last place for a third time in 2004, moving him into a tie for second in the 2004 Last Car Cup Series Championship, trailing only Joe Rudman. With the 10 chase races still to go, and Bodine entered in Arnold's car for seven of them, Bodine's Truck Series Renaissance would also see him battle for the last place crown and cup. It began well enough at Loudoun, where Bodine matched his 23rd place finish at Bristol. Jeff Fuller ran the car at Dover, made it just seven laps, and finished last himself. After being involved in wrecks during all three restrictor plate races, the Arnold team didn't enter the fall race at Talladega, where Sport Clips had originally planned to back the team as they had in July. Instead, the team focused their attention on the Truck Series race at Fontana that weekend. This proved to be the right decision. Fourth start for the Jermaine Arnold Toyota, and it looks like maybe victory number one. Coming through three and four, smoke problems in front of him, and Todd Bodine and Ted Musgrave both miss Kelly Sutton, and it will be Todd Bodine claiming his first ever victory in the Truck Series. Uh, I'm with Don Arnold, and he just asked me, did I see that? Did you see what just about happened? I couldn't stand it. <laughs> my heart's in my throat. It's just a thrilling win. Four races in the Craftsman Truck Series, and you guys are to victory lane. Can you believe that's possible? What do we do next? <laughs> I'm just thrilled for everybody. We had a bad pit stop. We came back from 10th. We just did a great job. I got to give it to Todd and Mike and all the Toyota power, and they've just been great. Congratulations. You're a winner in NASCAR, buddy. Thank you, that's a great feeling. <laughs> Todd Bodine was back at Kansas, where another sponsor joined the Arnold team. This time, it was Atlanta-based U.S. Micro Corporation, the same company that sponsored Brett Bodine in his final Cup Series race at Indy a year earlier. U.S. Micro, which refurbished and resold computers from other companies, also became the team's official computer provider. These second-hand laptops and desktops helped Bodine qualify 20th, his best Cup start in a year, but steering problems after 66 laps left him 39th. This was the race where Kirk Schumerdine finished last in the Bush Cheney car, moving him to second in the last car standings. Fuller returned to Charlotte, where he crashed on lap 9. He was denied the last place finish, however, as Tony Raines had already been eliminated in a multi-car pileup at the start. The 42nd place finish kept him fifth in the rankings. Bodine, meanwhile, would win his second straight truck series race, this time at Texas. Building on the success of their truck team, Arnold had Bodine's cup car at Martinsville decorated in the same paint scheme. It didn't help the result. Car 50, yeah. he pulls it in the back now. Todd Bodine with the Bodine. flat tire and the jam up. By pulling behind the wall after the first lap, Bodine completed the fewest laps of any start by the team in 2004. He also moved to second in the last car standings, just one finish out of the lead with four races to go. Atlanta was U.S. Micro's home track, so the October 31st race saw the sponsor feature more prominently on the number 50. Bodine qualified a strong 24th, to which Jayski said, quote, the truck wins have this team humming. Bodine completed 222 of the 334 laps before falling out with handling issues, but low attrition meant this was only a 39th place finish. Then came Phoenix, where one championship would change hands. Bodine completed just 11 laps before exiting, securing his fifth last place finish of the year, and taking the lead in the last car standings on an insurmountable bottom five tiebreaker of 14 to seven. Bodine completed 143 laps at Darlington before crash damage left him 39th, then failed to qualify at Homestead, the only time Arnold Motorsports failed to qualify all season. And so, while Joe Rutman and the team he drove for will be the subject of our next episode, Bodine won the last car championship. After such a hot and cold conclusion to the 2004 season, the plan for the future of Arnold Motorsports seemed clear. Commit to a full-time truck series team in 2005 with Todd Bodine driving. But it didn't play out that way. Bodine secured a contract with Toyota and took it to a rival team in Fiddleback Racing. Chad Chaffin took Bodine's place in the truck, and Arnold continued to run the cup car part-time for Jimmy Spencer. The team again impressed at Bristol, where Spencer finished 21st, the best ever finished by Arnold's cup team. Two months later, Bodine reunited with the Jermaine Arnold team in the truck series. 
From there, Don Arnold and Bob Germain proceeded down two very different paths. Arnold's Cup team shut down at the end of the 2005 season, and he would return to work his real estate business. He died December 12, 2015, at age 73. Bob Germain took over Todd Bodine's Truck Series effort, which would score 19 more wins and two championships. In 2009, the former Germain Arnold racing team expanded into Cup, bringing back the Geico sponsorship that once backed Don Arnold's car. His driver was Max Pappas, who in the Gatorade duels in 2010 found himself racing Todd Bodine for a spot in the Daytona 500. Bodine was a last-minute substitution for Kirk Shelmerdine in what turned out to be the final attempt for Shelmerdine's team. Germain Racing continued to field the Geico number 13 until November of 2020. For all their success in the truck series, neither Arnold nor Germain ever won a cup race. But that is where another businessman from Florida comes in. In America, there exists a sport that is driven by the fans. They are why everyone works so hard. On the teams and at the tracks, in front of the grandstands and behind the scenes, to give the fans the greatest race possible. NASCAR fans deserve the best, starting from the high banks of Daytona, all the way to the shores of California, and at every race in between. NASCAR fans, you're the reason for our success. Thanks.